We say all praises be to the Creator, all power to His people. In the name of Yahshua, the Black Revolutionary Messiah, I greet you, my brothers and sisters, in the spirit of truth and the words of peace. Shalom Aleichem. Give a special salute to the Black Messiahs. Our motto is stop waiting for a Savior and be one. Stop waiting for a Savior and be one. This morning, family, coming from two scriptures, beginning with Nehemiah, first chapter, second verse, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came, he and certain men of Judah, and asked them concerning the Jews that had been Escaped, had escaped which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem and they said to me the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire and it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the Lord, the God of heaven. Going to Nehemiah. Second chapter, 17 verse. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. This morning, brothers and sisters, dealing with the topic, the downfall of Durham, the downfall of Durham. Let's go back to the scripture and put it into context. Jerusalem is in trouble. The children of Israel are in trouble because of their becoming, them becoming whores, going after false gods. setting up pagan images in the temple because of their disobedience to the Most High. They were allowed to go into captivity in Babylon. In Babylon. Now, let's be clear. Babylon Everybody didn't go to Babylon. They didn't want everybody. They wanted their best. Babylon wanted the best and the brightest. They didn't want everybody. So the poor were left in Jerusalem. The poor were left in Jerusalem. And it's said that in the scripture that those who actually went into captivity had it better than the ones who were left in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was ransacked, left in ruins, temple destroyed, wall destroyed, city destroyed. While some people who were in captivity, again, had it better than the people who were left in Jerusalem. If you look in the book of Ezra, it talks about how the temple was rebuilt. If you look in the book of Nehemiah, it talks about how the wall was rebuilt. See, the temple in Ezariah, I'm sorry, 
in Ezra, the temple in Ezra represents the spiritual nature of Israel. The wall in Nehemiah represents the social construct. Ezra is dealing with spiritual reform. Nehemiah is dealing with social reform. So you got to have both. You got to have your first and foremost. You got to get right with the creator. You got to have your spirit intact. But you also have to rebuild the infrastructure, the social structure, and build a wall around your city so those who, your enemies, won't just come back in and destroy the city and the temple again. So the people who were left in Jerusalem were suffering. Now the people... Both of those were still under foreign rule. And you, you see in the scriptures that the children of Israel want to be 100% free. See, black folks in America, we have different degrees of freedom. We have different degrees of freedom. See, some of us want 100% freedom. Some of us uh, want 75% freedom. Some of us just want a little bit of freedom so we can get drunk, get high, go to the club. That's all we want. We can be in captivity, but all, as long as we can be savage on the weekend, oh, we good. We good. But the children of Israel wanted 100% freedom. 100% freedom. So... Nehemiah, look back, and he saw the condition of Jerusalem. He said, you see the distress we are in, how Jerusalem lies in waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Durham, North Carolina, this morning, you're a reproach. You're a reproach, a disgrace. The laughing stock of North Carolina, who used to be Wall Street, Black Wall Street. People used to love Durham. The, Black Wall Street, you heard the story about Black Wall Street in Durham and how everything was supposedly so wonderful and everybody was, was prospering in Durham. Stop lying. Stop lying. Now let's tie this into the scripture. Black people have always, since we've come into this country, been under oppression. We have been under oppression. But some folks, Durham, North Carolina, have had it better than other folks. Some folks have gotten comfortable and left the poor behind. Yeah, you did. See, y'all don't like people talking about this. See, this is Durham's biggest secret. See, we talk about Hey, Ty, and we talk about Black Wall Street, but you don't want to deal with the fact that in reality, you left the poor behind to die. We do a house cleaning this morning. We do a house cleaning this morning. So when I hear uh, people talk about, well, what have, we used to be Black Wall Street and Durham was so prosperous. For some of y'all, yes. Just like today. Some of y'all are prospering. Some of y'all are comfortable in Durham. Other people are suffering. 
you wonder why the con condition of the hood is the way it is? It's because you left people behind to suffer. The brightest got brought into captivity in Babylon and live comparative, comparatively more comfortable than the people left behind, especially when Persia under Cyrus took over. Oh, they had it good. They had it good. But the people who you left behind were suffering. Were suffering. Brother, you just hating this morning. You just mad because some of us made it out and we got money. Shut up. Shut up. I'm coming with receipts again this morning. I'm coming with receipts again this morning. See, they don't want to talk about the how we got in this condition. Everybody wants to talk about the violence. Everybody wants to talk about the poverty. Everybody wants to talk about Durham, but nobody wants to deal with how we really got into this condition. The, the, those who empower the politicians, they will talk about the problem, but they ain't going to tell you how we got here because it'll step on too many toes. It'll step on too many toes who are still in power to this day. But we're going to deal with it. I ain't running for office. I ain't running for mayor. I ain't running for city council. So I ain't got nothing to lose if I tell the truth. I don't like some of y'all. Some of y'all don't like me. So I have nothing to lose by telling the truth and bringing the receipts. No, let's bring the receipts. There are two books you can read, and it gives a pretty good picture about Durham and what went on and how Durham was Black Wall Street, Upbuilding Black Durham by Leslie Brown, and Durham's Hayti by Dr. Andre Vaughn and Dr. Beverly Washington Jones. Gives the bright side for the most part of Durham and how Durham used to be Black Wall Street and Hayti, we had black this and black that. But that's only part of the story. That's only part of the story. If we're ever going to get our people out of condition, if we're going to stop the shootings and the killings in the hood, we got to really deal with the fact that some people have sold us out and left people in the hood to die. Sold us out. For that, you got to read books they don't want you to read. I'm talking about Dr. Christina Green's book, Our Separate Ways, Women and the Black Freedom Movement in Durham, North Carolina. Read that one. O'Shea Gray Davidson, I think it's Dr. O'Shea Gray Davidson, The Best of Enemies. Read that one. And if you really want to get into the dirt and what happened to Durham, read Liberalism, Black Power, and the Making of American Politics by Professor Devin Fergus. Professor Devin Fergus. Read those books. Because a lot of people don't realize the forces that destroyed Durham. The people who sold Durham out. Especially those of us who stood up for black power. Yeah. They sold us out. They sold us out and left your babies to die on these streets. Ask the elders. See, some of the elders will tell you what really happened. Some of the elders will really break down what really happened to Durham. well off, left the poor to die in these streets. Those who had the ability, those who had the finances, those who had the, 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 the intelligence to lift 
everybody up. They just lifted their clique up. They lifted their homeboy and homegirl up and forgot about everybody else. Again, just like in the Bible days, Although we are all as black people, and they'll tell you, well, it doesn't matter what side of track you're on, and, 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 and we all black people, and we all suffering in Durham, and we all are going through stuff. Stop! Stop! All suffering is not the same. All suffering is not the same. Some of y'all ain't got to worry about bullets flying through your windows at night. Some people do. Some people don't have to worry about unsanitary living conditions in the city. Some people do. We ain't the same. Your suffering and my suffering ain't the same. And we got to uh, uh, stop with the narrative, stop with the lie that everything is equal in Durham. And there are segments of this city who are suffering disproportionately. No matter how many businesses you bring in, no matter how many of these giant corporations, Apple, Google, whoever, who, and, and they tell you that, well, these, these, these average salary, when they bring uh, these jobs in, it's going to be $100,000. That's what they tell you. So right now, I'm working at McDonald's. I'm working at Burger King. You mean to tell me I'm supposed to feel good because a giant corporation is coming in, an international corporation is coming in, and some people are going to make $100,000 a year when I know that ain't going to be me. That ain't going to be me. So when I see all this talk about economic prosperity and I see all this talk about businesses and jobs and people make $100,000 and all, all you got to do is, 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 is just go to school or whatever and I can get that $100,000 job too. When it doesn't happen, the hood gets frustrated. The hood gets frustrated. You're telling me on one hand that I should, if I live in Durham, I should be at one of these jobs making $100,000 a year, but I'm still suffering. Mama's suffering. Grandma's suffering. So I'm frustrated now. I'm frustrated now. I need to take it out on somebody. And, you know, we've been told that don't mess with white folks. That's, that's ingrained in our minds ever, ever since slavery. Don't mess with white folks. Why? It's not just economic. It's not economic. Because people say, well, uh, are you a, uh, the reason why black people attack other black people, because only black people live in those neighborhoods and they strike out against those who are close to them. That made sense 30 years ago. That made sense 30 years ago, but when you're dealing now with gentrification, gentrification, and you got black people scared to go in the hood, but in that same neighborhood, you got white people walking around with poodles and coffee and jogging like everything's sweet because they know we've been so programmed that black people are only going to attack other black people. They know about the psychological condition, and you can throw all the money in the world you want at programs, but until you break up the psychological condition, like Dr. Carter G. Woodson called it, the miseducation of the Negro, we're never going to be out of this physical condition unless we break the psychological condition. So black people attacking black people because they know they're comfortable and safe and there's not going to be any repercussion if they attack other black people. So in order to get their frustration out, they're going to attack other black people. It might be 10 white people jogging down the street, but they're going to smile at them and, 
and wave at them and how you doing ma'am and walk right across the street to attack a black person. Psychological conditioning. Psychological conditioning that goes back to that slave plantation theology that they taught us in the, in the slavery days that God was white. That Yahshua or Jesus was white. Because when you see white people jogging, through, when you see a black person in the hood, that's an op. That's an op. That's an enemy. But when you see a white person in the same neighborhood, you look at that white person, and because of that slave plantation mentality, you think that's God. Somebody talk to me this morning. Subconsciously, when you see that white person, that black person, <clears throat> you think that's the devil. <clears throat> and that devil's responsible for all your suffering. But you see a white person in the same neighborhood, subconsciously, in the back of your mind. That's God. That's God. Until we break that plantation theology, brothers and sisters, we are never ever going to be free. So, we look at the streets of Durham right now. We talk, look at the downfall of Durham right now. We look at how uh, uh, the walls have been destroyed and the city's on fire and we are now in reproach. We are reproach. Laughing stop. The question is, how are we going to fix it? How are we going to fix it? Now, there's some theological differences about who came uh, back first from Babylonian captivity, whether it was Ezra or Nehemiah. It's, it's some, but we're just going to deal with the way the chronological or the order it is in the Bible. First of all, to fix it. We need spiritual reform. We need spiritual reform. We got to get rid of that plantation theology. That slave religion. And I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm talking about the translation of it that was given to us by our slave, those who enslaved our ancestors. We got to get rid of that. We got to get rid of that. So it takes a theological reform. We got to stop believing that the reason why black people are suffering in Durham is because we're cursed. We got to get that plantation theology, spirituality, out of us. It ain't gonna happen overnight. It ain't it didn't it didn't we didn't get this condition overnight and we're not gonna get out of this condition overnight. But first we have to identify with this condition before we're ever going to get out of this condition. So we got to have spiritual reform, ideological reform that somehow you don't the, 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 the hood is always going to be the hood because that's just the way it is. And some people are always going to be up here and other people are always going to be down there. And that's just the way it is. That's the way it was ordained. That's the way it's created. Ideological and spiritual reform, first and foremost. Because if we don't get our minds right and our spirits right, we're never going to do the other stuff that's necessary to save our community. Secondly, we got to get into social, economic, political reform. Ezra dealt with the spiritual. Nehemiah dealt with the social, political, economic, that aspect, reform. The nuts and bolts of rebuilding the wall. What does it look like when we try to rebuild 
uh, the black community in Durham? What does it look like if we want to rebuild or build again a black Wall Street that includes everybody, not just a few black rich folks? What does that look like? Do we have the resources? Yes. Do we have the brain power? Yes. But we have to have the uh, will to rebuild the wall around the city. Not just put a fence around your house and you think that you and your family are good because you got a, a, a fence around your city. You live in a gated community where the rest of the city is going to hell in a handbasket. Because you may think you're safe and secure because you live in a gated community, but, every, but eventually you're going to have to go out of that gate into Durham. Eventually. We got to rebuild the wall, brothers and sisters. We have to rebuild the wall. I'm going to leave with four steps. Four steps. Number one, identify the problem. First and foremost, identify the problem. What's really going on in Durham? What's really going on in Durham? Do we not need, uh, 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 what, what's really going on with, with, with the crime and the violence and, and where is it coming from and, 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 and who's being affected? Is, is 911 really uh, uh, taking long to answer, too long to answer the phone calls? Is, it, it, it do, do we not have the proper uh, security in neighborhoods? Is, is money going to waste uh, on, on, on things that don't work in Durham? We got to identify the problem first and foremost. Secondly, once we have identified the problem, we get together and we come up with a solution. After identifying the problem, number two is we come up with a solution. How do we solve the problem? What is the historical uh, um, uh, uh, lineage of the problem we're facing? How do we get here? Because if we don't understand and analyze how we got here, we're never going to know how to get out of it. So we come together, number two, and come up with a solution. Number three. We tell the community the solution. See, some of y'all sit in these, uh, these uh, meetings just to get grant money. And you, don't, you come up with all these solutions, but you're going to wait and sit on it till you can get a grant. And you ain't going to tell nobody the solution that y'all came up with because you don't want nobody to take your grant. So you don't tell the whole community. You're going to tell your homegirl, your homeboy, your, your, your cousin, and, your, your, and, and, and everybody else. Well, you know, this money is available over here. And, you know, I just went to this meet last night, and the city's giving out $10,000. And all you got to do is fill out a piece of paper or get a 501c and, you know, come get some of this money. Ain't got to do nothing with it. But as long as you say you're using it to help Durham, as long as you say that, come get this money. Don't tell nobody, but come get this money. Then we got to deal with, make sure once we get the information out to everybody. I ain't talking about just your clique. I'm talking about everybody. We got to deal with the misinformation because there are some people, once you come with the truth, they're going to try to distort the truth and hide the truth and change the truth and rearrange the truth and switch the truth. And this comes from enemies, just like in when they were trying to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. There were people on the inside and the people on the outside who worked against the rebuilding of the wall. Once you start trying to empower the masses of our people, they're going to be people on the inside and people on the outside trying to uh, prevent you from doing what you're trying to do. And number four, we implement those solutions in the hood, boots on the ground. We implement those solutions in the hood, boots on 
the ground. So the four steps are one, identify the problem, two, find a solution, three, tell the community and weed out the misinformation, and four, implement the solutions on the ground. So brothers and sisters, I ask you this morning as we close, as we look at the destruction and the downfall of the Bull City, let us join together and make a dedication to each other and most importantly to ourselves that starting today, brothers and sisters, we're going to rebuild the wall. As always, we leave it with the Black Messiah motto, stop waiting for a savior and be one. Shalom.